So we're in Mark 7. In the passage before us, we're, we're kind of coming out of a response, a, a teaching that Jesus gives about inner purity. And it's interesting, as you go through the Gospel of Mark, much of what Mark records for us in his Gospel account is very focused on the events of Jesus' life. There, there's parables for sure, but more than anything else, Mark is giving us this very fast-paced insight into what Jesus accomplishes in his life and in his ministry. But in Mark 7, especially where we are this morning, we're coming out of this response, this teaching he gives regarding of what it actually means to be pure before God. And here's the reality. His teaching, it leaves every single one of us in the same boat. Who in the world can be pure before God? It's almost though here in Mark 7 that he kind of, he, he drops like a theological bomb upon those who are reading this text. Jesus said there in verse so 21 of chapter 7 that it's from within, from the heart, that that's where evil thoughts come. And I think many of us would go, okay, yeah, I see that. It's not about religious ceremony. That's not what purity, it's about the heart. But he goes on in that teaching in the first half of this chapter where Jesus says sexual immorality, theft. We go, yes, yes, I see that, Jesus. Murder, adultery, I agree. Coveting, wickedness. Okay, that's getting a little closer to home. Deceit, sensuality, you got me. Envy, slander, someone would say, is it getting hot in here? Like pride, foolishness, all these things come from within. And that's what defiles a person. And here's what's happening in Mark 7. Everyone, everyone, everyone is in the same boat of sin, of need, of failure, of lack, of shortcoming. Everyone. Make sure I get this clear. Everyone. Everyone is an outsider before God. No one is in the in crowd without God intervening. So what does God do? Well, that's the theme of this book. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. If there's any ambiguity about who Jesus is, this is the good news. The Evangelion, a royal announcement that there's something kingly about this guy. He's the promised Messiah, Mashiach, Christ, the Greek word for that, the Son of God. Verse 15 of chapter 1, Jesus preached that the time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Everyone, all of us, on stage, in seats, behind a screen, we're in the same boat. So God sends his son, the king, the Messiah, so that through faith in him, we can be on the inside. We can experience what Mark talks about so often, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not some distant land far off in a distance, some, some time that's yet to come. The kingdom of God is now. God's very presence, God's very rule, God's very authority, God's very hand of grace upon your life. God sends his son. And here's the thing. Not just to the Jewish people, but to the whole world. And today in Mark 7, here's what's going to happen. Mark gives us two examples, two individuals, two different people, male and female, who are truly, especially those who would have been spending time with Jesus, are definitely on the outside. There's not even any question. But who have an experience with Jesus and ultimately experience his grace. Look at verse 24. It tells us there that then after this teaching that was given, Jesus left Galilee 
and went north to the region of Tyre. Okay, I actually want to stop right there. Twelve whole words into this first verse that we're considering this morning because there's actually a lot there that, that's really easy to miss the importance of and how the rest of the passage opens up to us by what Mark is just sharing to us about Jesus and what he just did. He leaves the area of Galilee where he spent a, a majority of his ministry. Especially as you read through the Gospel of Mark, a lot of it is centered there around the region of Galilee. In John's Gospel, much of the, the ministry that he focuses on is around the city of Jerusalem. And each writer has a, a specific reason for emphasizing those locations. And here's the deal. Unless you've spent a lot of time in these places or you're a geography buff, many of the places in the Bible, well, they're a bit unfamiliar a bit foreign to us. So the natural tendency is just to kind of read over that. Okay, Jesus, he left Galilee, he went north to this region called Tyre. You can skim over it and maybe miss the fact that Mark is drawing attention to this. This change in scenery, this change in location. There's a reason for it. He tells us that he travels north. To, to the region of Tyre, somewhere between 40 and 50 miles. Not in an Uber. Not on an electric skateboard. Not on an e-bike. Not drafting behind Creighton Brogdon and just going 26 miles an hour on an analog bike. I mean, they're walking. They're, they're taking this time to get to the region of Tyre. It's north of Israel. And listen, here's the deal. It's not a part of Israel. This is Gentile territory. And some of the things that we'll read about this morning, some of the things that Jesus does, they're going to seem extremely weird to you if you don't understand the setting in which Jesus is in. Well, here's a little bit of the setting, this area of Tyre. Here's a little bit of history. Tyre was a proud, historic, Canaanite-controlled area. There was a time kind of in that time when Israel as a nation was in some of its glory days, like the king of David. During that time, they were on friendly terms with the nation of Israel, but became a very wicked people, so much so that the book of Ezekiel would tell us that their king even placed himself in a declaration to be God. And when Jerusalem was destroyed... In 586 B.C., this region, they actually rejoiced over it. A little bit of tension there. There's also, you know, some religious barriers between Tyre and Israel. There, there's a good Bible commentator by the name of William Barclay, and these are his words. He says this, The Jew had an immense contempt for the Gentile. The Gentiles, said the Jews, were created by God to only be fuel for the fires of hell. In the mind of a Jew, if you saw a woman of Gentile descent who's about to give birth, well, it wasn't lawful for you to help her in any way. Because all you would be doing is bringing another Gentile into the world. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, or vice versa, that family of the Jews actually had a funeral for their child. Like this is the, the viewpoint of Jew and Gentile. And Jews would often refer to Gentiles as rabid, scavenging, disease-ridden dogs like hyena or jackals. There's tremendous like religious cultural tension. There's historical stuff that's happened. Like when Jerusalem was conquered and the, and the people of God were brought into captivity. Tyre did a, like a, a little clap. But there's also envy. You say, what do you mean? Economically, the region of Tyre was more successful than Israel at this time. Beautiful area. In the region of Tyre, there's also a city of Tyre. 
And that city was filled with Greek architecture and pagan temples and tremendous wealth there. They, they bought a lot of their food from the area of Galilee and some of the Galileans where Jesus is coming from. They looked at the people of Tyre as almost like taking their stuff, taking their jobs. And the people in Galilee often resented the people of Tyre because they felt outclassed. And many assume just negative. Anytime you saw anyone from Tyre, they're probably just here to take over our territory. They're just here to get our goods. They're... they're Josephus. This was a secular Roman, a Jewish historian hired by the Romans that notes this, that Tyre, for the Jews, it was their most bitter of enemies. They hated each other. And what does verse 24 tell us in those first 12 words? Well, Jesus and his boys decided to go up there. Interesting scene. What's got to be going on in the minds of the disciples? Are they suspicious of every single person they encounter? Remember, this is at a time when Jesus' ministry, his popularity was thronging with needy crowds. You know, we're living in an interesting time. On social media, there are these like AI artistic accounts. And recently I saw this AI art generated scene, and it's meant to depict the... Uh, the scene of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now, we've studied through this recently, and as you look at that, because you know your Bibles, because you go to Coastline Calvary Chapel and you've read through the book, you know that, wait a second, there's something weird about that scene. The, the setting is completely wrong. Like, like where Jesus fed the 5,000 was in a very rural place where there were no towns around. That's half the reason he did it. They couldn't get anywhere. But one of the things I thought was interesting about this is to remind you of kind of the dynamics of what Jesus was experiencing on a day-to-day -day scene. These are the kind of crowds that are coming around Jesus everywhere they are. And it gives some insight into what Mark says there in verse 24. Look at it with me. He says, Jesus didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in. Why? Because everywhere he goes, that's what happens. Right? Remember, if you remember contextually what's going on in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is trying to get away with his disciples for a little bit of rest, for a little bit of retreat. Everywhere they go, they're being inundated by people. And so as Mark says in chapter 7, verse 24, he didn't want anyone to know where he was staying, but he couldn't keep it a secret. In verse 25, right away a woman who had heard about him came and fell at his feet her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit, and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. And look at what Mark says here. Since she was a Gentile, born in Syrian Phoenicia. And he's going to explain why that matters in a moment. But it would seem that Jesus here retreats to Tyre because of this frenzied Jesus mania of Galilee. It's just getting out of control. He and his disciples, they find kind of a discreet home to stay in. But his fame just continues to grow. He can't stay under the radar. And it's like the plot thickens. Jesus is now entire, historically, culturally, religiously, economically, a place of great suspect for his disciples. And who finds them? The Syrophoenician woman. Why does Mark like make that point? That simply means the descendant of someone from the land of Canaan, like one of the arch enemies of the Jews. And as a mom, she's begging him for help on behalf of her daughter. She's persistent. She's loud. She's tenacious. She's relentless. Matthew 15, the account that also parallels this story, tells us that the disciples are getting so irritated with her that they tell him, Jesus, just send this woman away. Maybe they're thinking her daughter is possessed by a demon. What do you expect? Look where we are. This is a Syrophoenician woman, a woman. You're not even supposed to have dealings with a woman in that culture. And in the area of Tyre, what are we doing here? Mark paints a scene that could not more fully illustrate a person and a place that is more far removed from being holy. Does that make sense? Like the text comes, comes alive in Scripture when you understand the context. 
Jesus has just given this teaching about inner purity, where it comes from. And then Mark tells a story about Jesus encountering this woman, this woman in Tyre, a Syrophoenician, who's begging Jesus because her daughter is demon-possessed. And I don't know, from our kind of like common, kind of sanitized 21st century lens of who Jesus is, meek and mild, caring and compassionate, his response, I don't think the word interesting even begins to describe it. Look at verse 27. Jesus tells her, first, I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. This is Jesus, meek and mild. Jesus doesn't help. In fact, in Matthew 15, it says like, while she was saying all these things for a while, he just stayed silent, didn't respond. And when he finally opens up his mouth, he responds in almost like a, a parabolic way, like he's speaking in parables. He, he refers to the Jewish people as children and to the Gentiles, seemingly specifically this woman, a dog. I don't know much, but I know that doesn't go over well if you're trying to build a bridge to someone. But there's this softening aspect to his response. You see, the word for dogs here, it's not a word of like the scavenging type dog that so often a woman in that scenario, okay, I'm in Tyre, I'm Syrophoenician, I'm a woman having a connection here with a Jewish male rabbi. So often what you would have heard from the lips of a Jew is this description of this scavenging hyena-like dog. Jesus doesn't use that word here, but a word that means like little puppies of the home. Anyone seen that rendition of Clifford the Big Red Dog? Seen that? My kids were watching it last night. Before he gets the big red dog, he's that little like tic-tac of a dog, you know, little red thing, red as Lucas's shirt, so to speak. It's like the cute, he's like sleeping next to the girl. Like that's the language that Jesus uses here. It isn't right to take food from the children and give it to the, listen, the puppies. Again, the NUV, the NUT, Neil's uninspired version or translation. Here's what I think. It's uninspired, just Neil. I think Jesus was actually being a, a bit more gracious than we read into the text. That there's this element of even offering hope to her. You say, what do you mean? Jesus wasn't calling this mother, this Gentile woman, a scavenging dog, but a little puppy. It's almost like there's this crack of a door of hope that's unique, especially considering where he is. He's at the B and B of his bitter enemies, right? Where he's, why he's there. He's there to rest. Who she is. She's a Gentile. She's a woman. She's Syrophoenician. And there's this crucial word of Jesus. First. The first it goes to the kids, the Jewish people. Jesus is giving an open door saying, I must first minister to Israel before I minister to the Gentiles. Paul kind of said a similar thing in Romans. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's God's power for salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and also to the Greek. And her response, well, it's interesting. Let's read it. She replies, that's true, Lord. But even the dogs under the table, even the little puppies, are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. With amazing humility, presence of mind, wit, she accepts what Jesus is saying. She doesn't argue with him about first being the promised Messiah to the Jews. She accepts the metaphor and kind of builds upon it. Jesus, even the puppies eat too. You know, historically in that day, there weren't a lot of napkins and often how children would wipe their mouths were just with pieces of bread. So crumbs are falling all over the place. And she makes this statement, Jesus, even the puppies eat the crumbs. Her response is short, humble, full of faith, 
fervent, modest, respectful, rational, relies on the mercy of God, and persistent. And let me have your attention. This is a tremendous lesson from this interaction with Jesus. This mom with the wrong background, the wrong social position, the wrong place that she's in. She doesn't have the upper hand in life, but she has faith, and Jesus is giving her an open door. And what does she do? She goes through it. And so what does Jesus say? Good answer in verse 29. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. And when this woman, when she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. Jesus heals. Here in the Gospel of Mark, also in the Gospel of Matthew, his words show a great sense of admiration for the faith that she has. She evidences great faith. And without even saying a word, he says, listen, it's done. Your daughter's healed. When she goes home, she finds her sleeping in peace. A Gentile who's in the region of Tyre, a woman Culturally, you know the disadvantages in that time. Shows more faith than any of the Jewish men that Jesus would have been speaking to about inner purity. Warren Wiersbe says this, Great faith is faith that takes God at his word, and listen to this, will not let go until God meets the need. Great faith can lay hold of even the slightest encouragement and turn it into a fulfilled promise. Lord, increase our faith. No one, no one is too far gone to be reached by God. No one is too far gone. Mark is illustrating this here by placing this episode in the life of Jesus right after the teach on, teaching on purity. It's the things from within that defile. All of us are in that boat. And he's like saying, here, look, even someone who's in the wrong place from the wrong people and in the cultural context of the implications that she's a woman connecting with a Jewish rabbi, this is all sorts of wrong here. If anyone's in the wrong boat, it's this woman. But what happens? Jesus gives her this open door, and she takes it. Why? Because God so loves the world that he gave his one and only son, and today is always the day of salvation for everyone and for anyone. Listen to how Paul describes this for us in the book of Galatians. He says, you are all children of God. How? Because you're born, and that makes you a child of God. No? No? Through faith in Christ Jesus. That's how you're a child of God. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you're the true children of Abraham. You're heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. This is the beauty of the gospel, dear friends, that we are brought into the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And what Mark is showing us here, no one is too far gone to be reached by God. It's in and through Jesus alone that we're his children. Jesus is giving her an open door to faith, and she takes it. And listen, let me have your attention. Jesus does the same thing for you and I today. See, how do you know that? Well, this isn't the N-U-T, Neil's uninspired translation. This is the Bible. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because we did good this week. Because of the blood of Jesus. Let me say this again. Dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Why, church? Because of the blood of who? Jesus. Jesus. Because of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new way and a life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God. How? 
with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. So let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. This woman takes Jesus at his word and trusts by faith. And listen, it's like this little morsel of truth. Ah, the little puppies. She sees that as an opportunity. Okay, I see that. I'm going to continue to put my trust in who Jesus is. She has this morsel to put her faith in. We have the full word of God. God's not angry at you or upset with you. Hebrews chapter 10, come boldly before his throne. Why? Because of who Jesus is. See, her response, it's short, it's humble, it's full of faith. She doesn't give up. And listen, there is this mysterious balance in our faith and trust in Jesus with things we don't see or know. In faith, sometimes, we need to go until there's a no. That's what this woman does. Like this morning, we're praying for Jace McClendon, praying in faith that Jesus would heal. Set, set yourself in this woman's sandals. She could have made a lot of assumptions, right? She could have heard that Jesus was in town, but she could have said, well, he's on holiday. I don't want to bug him. She could have said, well, we're in Tyre. They're, they're probably suspicious of anyone who knocks on that door. I can't do that. I can't bug him. I wasn't invited to see Jesus. Should I, should I show up? I, I'm Syrophoenician. The, the Jews, they hate us. They don't want anything to do with us. I, I'm a woman. I can't approach a Jewish rabbi. What would have happened to her precious daughter, if she would have done nothing. You know what would have happened? This is what would have happened. Nothing. Nothing would have happened if she, by faith, wouldn't have moved out of the realm of assumption, worry, fear, and took a step of faith and persistently sought after Jesus. You know what would have happened if she would have done nothing? Nothing. That's what would have happened. And here's the lessons I think we can glean from this. By faith, she was persistent and humble, and it's like she's on her toes leaning into Jesus. She's listening to what he says, and she hears him say all the little puppies, and she's like, oh, but even the puppies get some bread, Jesus. She's leaning in. And in this instance, her daughter was healed. And here's a couple lessons I think we can glean from this text that I hope we can take to heart. Number one is this. There is no one who is too far gone to be reached by God. No one. And second, in faith, sometimes we need to go until there's a no to keep pressing in. As the author of Hebrews would say, to boldly enter heaven's most holy place, go right into his presence with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. And I want to encourage you to do something this morning. I want to encourage you to lean in to the Lord, to cast all of your cares, all of your concerns, all of your burdens, all of those things that make you weary and downtrodden at his feet and to keep doing it to lean in by faith. What would have happened to this little girl if her mom would have done nothing? Nothing. Nothing would have happened. And here's the thing we need to hear. Here's the thing we need to know. Prayer does change things. You've heard this many times if you've been in church for any length of time, that most often what prayer changes is us. Yes and amen to that. Like speaking to Jesus, being in his word, yes, that's transformative to us. But also... But also, 
This woman's prayer in faith changed the outcome. How does all that work? I don't know. But I know that it works. If this woman would have done nothing, nothing would have happened to her daughter. But by faith, she's leaning in and calling out to Jesus. And Jesus responds. Listen, sometimes in faith, we need to go for it until there's a no. Now, don't take that so far and say, okay, just in, we have God's word in God's people as this tremendous anchoring place for our souls, that God's spirit will never lead you in contrary to what God's word says. But I think some of us sometimes could do with a little bit more leaning into Jesus, a little more tiptoe response to what he has to say and to trust him and to know that he can work great and wondrous miracles. And sometimes faith requires us to go until there's a no, to keep pressing in. Well, Mark now gives us a second insightful account as Jesus is in Gentile territory. You see he describes his travels in verse 31. Look at verse 31. It says that Jesus, after all this happened, left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee. And he's in the region of the Ten Towns, also known as the Decapolis. Now, Mark's description of this is interesting. One Bible commentator said this, to, to make the note that Jesus goes from Tyre to the city of ten towns known as Decapolis, it's like doing that by way of Sidon. It's like going from Los Angeles to New Orleans by way of Canada. Like, it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense geographically, but I think what Mark's point is, is to orient us culturally, culturally and emphasize that these locations that Jesus is in, that he's in, are populated by Gentiles. And with all that said, one of the most interesting, unique, peculiar, even specific to Mark's account alone, is this miracle we're about to read. Now, here's what I want to submit to you. Everything that we're about to read, all of these peculiar actions of Jesus, I believe they're rooted in compassion, tenderness, empathy, and ultimately love. Here's what happens. Look at verse 32. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him. And the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. So Jesus led him away from the crowd so he could be alone. Put his fingers into the man's ears and then spitting on his own fingers, he touches the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighs and says, Ephathatha, which means be opened. And instantly, the man could hear perfectly and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. So after service today, Pastor Joe's going to be in the back. He's got his like, <laughs> he's ready to rock and roll if you need any help or support. Like you go, what is going on here? Like, why, why does, what is going on here? Well, let me submit this to you. I think everything that we just read, I think it's rooted in compassion and tenderness and, and empathy. You say, what do you mean by that? There's a man who's deaf, who's unable to speak. We're not told if the crowds are the ones who brought this man to Jesus, wanting to witness a miracle, or if it's a group of friends. Like, remember that account of the man who was paralyzed and he was lowered through the roof and he had these friends that just made it happen for him. We're not told contextually in this account, at least, exactly who and how and why this man is brought before Jesus. But they, we know they want to see him healed. And Jesus, I don't know how he did this. With the crowds being what they were, somehow he gets this man one-on-one -on -one with him. I don't know if the disciples are like making a human barrier. I don't know what's going on in this scene. But he gets the man alone. And he does some odd things. In that culture, they may make a little more sense. The, the fingers in the man's ears. Listen, this man can't hear, but he can see. And so Jesus is using gestures, potentially, about what he's about to do. Takes his fingers and puts them in the man's ears. He, he spits on his fingers and touches the man's tongue. And that culture, saliva, was believed to have medicinal value. 
Maybe, again, you're getting the N-U-T, right? Neil's uninspired. Maybe he's evidencing to the man what he's about to do. Okay? He's showing the man on his level, reaching to him on his level out of compassion of why he's there. I think compassion, empathy, tenderness is the tone of this somewhat intimate moment with Jesus. And Jesus looks to heaven, the source of his power, just like he did when he broke the bread and fed the multitude. And he sighs. The language here is, is a deep sigh, a sigh of compassion. A, and he prays to his father. And he says this Aramaic word, Ephaphatha, Ephaphatha. Like if you're deaf and you can't hear that, potentially you can see what he's saying. The word simply means be opened. Jesus is touching his ears, touching his tongue, saying a word that he knows he can't hear. But perhaps he can see. And instantly the man could hear and speak. Now, the crowd evidently wasn't too far away because verse 36 tells us Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. The miracle wasn't intended to kind of foster and fuel Messiah mania that's been sweeping the crowds. I believe Jesus is compassionate, loving, and kind. That's why he heals this man. And it says in verse 37, they were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. I love this. Everything he does is wonderful. Kind of reminds me of that Genesis account after God created everything, that everything is good. And they say, he makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. It's interesting. It's one of the most grateful receptions Jesus receives. And where does it happen? Amongst his own? Not in Gentile land. And one of the most amazing things about this, especially for you that love to just be students of the Scripture, they're saying something that the prophet Isaiah prophesied about seven centuries earlier. Listen to this prophecy from Isaiah 35. Say to those who are fearful-hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb will sing. Jesus there is fulfilling a prophecy 700 years before his arrival of what the Messiah would do. And the lesson I think we glean from this is the compassion and love that Jesus has. He gets one-on-one -on -one with this guy, gets on his level, touches his ears and his tongue with saliva, speaks a word that maybe, maybe, though he couldn't hear what Jesus was saying, he could see it. And the man's healed. And I don't know about you, but isn't this one of the first things that the enemy calls into question when it's difficult to hear from God or maybe be even able to speak to God in a way that you feel is meaningful? What? This lie that the enemy so often whispers, he doesn't care. God doesn't care. One of the lessons this encounter with Jesus has with this man shows us that he reaches down to our level. God doesn't owe us anything, but he draped his son in humanity, put flesh on, so that he could be our savior. He got on our level, so to speak. And my prayer is the same prayer of Paul's. Let me read it to you. He says this out of the book of Ephesians. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ, this is the prayer, will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. And your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. I love what he prays. Not that you would just know more about God, but that you would know his love. 
And that's where the roots would draw strength. Okay, I know that he loves me. Henry Blackaby wrote that great book in the 90s, Experiencing God. And he said, if you can't describe your, your relationship with God as a love relationship, you should stop everything you're doing and entreat the Holy Spirit to give you clarity of God's love for you. Because everything flows in your relationship with God, hearing from God on this basis. A love relationship. Not a legal relationship. Not a church relationship. But a personal relationship where you know that he loves me. Paul prays that your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. You need to know that God loves you, that he cares about you. And here's the thing I would say as we close this morning. Three little lessons I, I hope you take away from these two episodes that Mark intentionally lays right next to this teaching about inner purity. Who can be pure? None of us. We're all in the same boat. And it's like Mark shows this illustration of this mama with her daughter who's got this little morsel of truth to attach her faith to. And here's the reality. Here's the truth. There's no one too far gone to be reached by God. And in faith, sometimes we need to go until there's a no, just like this woman. And third, I feel like Paul, man, I'm just praying you get this. This simple but powerful and revolutionary truth. He loves you. He loves you. I'm praying that the, the roots in your heart would be saturated in this truth because the enemy is going to throw things at you through situation or challenge or relationships or experience that are going to make you feel like, God, do you care? Do you see? And what does Jesus do with this man who can't hear? He can't speak. He gets him one on one takes his fingers. So okay, I'm going to put him in that earwax. I'm going to touch your tongue. I'm, I'm going to speak a word that maybe you can't hear, but you can see. Out of love. Out of tenderness. Out of compassion. God did not just send his son to the world just to pay our debt, but also to show us who God is. For three years, you see these examples through miracles and through teachings and through the discipleship of Jesus of, okay, this is what God is like. He reaches down right into our mess because he loves us. Because he loves us. And I pray that we as a church, that you as individuals, that you as families, that you would know, have the power to understand the depth of God's love for you. It's displayed in no better place than the cross of Jesus Christ, where he takes your place. And again, you know this about me if we've spent any time together. I've got this challenge in my life that I'm an addicted alliterator. Six kids with all letter L. But it, when you think about salvation, know that you're forgiven, that you're free, that you're part of a family, and you have a future. Brand that into your brain every morning. God, you love me because of your love. I'm your kid. Sin doesn't have to have power and authority over me. I'm not alone. I've got brothers and sisters all over this world. And God, you have a future for me. Church, I pray that you would simply know that Jesus loves you. I know that's not anything like, wow, had you ever heard that? Wasn't that sermon? Let's tweet that sermon. I mean, I never heard these things. No one's too far gone. Have faith in Jesus and know that he loves you. Build your life on these simple but revolutionary truths. Watch what God will do.